Okay, welcome everyone. Um, our session is about data capture for smarter mission delivery. Um, I'm Kate from Superhighways and... I'm Sorrel from Superhighways. So we're doing a little bit of a, a double act um, this morning. Um, just a little bit before we start about Superhighways, has anybody in the room heard of us before? We've got a couple of, a few hands. Um, so we've been going for 20 years supporting the small local charities and community groups, um, predominantly in South London, but we're kind of working across London now. And when I say small, I mean definitely under a million and probably many more under 500 and quite a lot under 100k. It'd be quite nice for us just to get a sense in the room today. How many people are from charities under 1 million? Okay, good. Keep your hands up if that's under 100k, under 100,000. Good. Oh, okay. So we've got a few micro charities in the room as well. So we do um, lots of things. We um, provide tech support. We have our own digital inclusion um, programs. And we've just come out of a five-year project helping groups better capture and communicate their impact. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the session, really, we've kind of turned it around a little bit. It's about how to be smarter with your data capture. So we're going to look at some free and low cost digital tools that will help you with that. We're used to working with organizations um, on a shoestring. So we've had to be, you know, very often that makes, forces you to be creative and look for free tools. Sometimes that means you get dependent on free tools that then no longer are free. So we'll, we'll then point out some of those. So we'll look at some online forms, thinking about images as well as data and how you can um, capture those to tell stories. We'll um, look at audio, a little bit on systems, and then we end a little bit on data visualization. For some of you might have been in the session just now. Actually, we were thinking it's rewinding. We're doing the bit before and um, ending where Katie's just picked off. We're also um, built in some hands-on kind of interactivity. So we'll just see how that goes in terms of time and Wi-Fi. Um, so bear with us. Um, but actually, we're going to start now. <laughs> Um, we're going to ask you to take out your smartphone. Don't worry if you're not hooked onto the Wi-Fi. It's not um, heavy on data. We use this tool quite a lot. It's free. It's called Mentimeter. Um, but what, what I need you to do is open a browser and go to menti.com, and you'll be asked to put in a code, and the six digits are on the screen. So 193040. And yes, you can. We're gonna, it's, a, it's an online data capture tool, so we're kind of practicing what we're preaching in the session. Um, and it's something that might be useful for you going forwards. It's free for um, two questions, but you can have unlimited presentations. I'm going to go, we're going to switch on to the internet in a minute, so we'll see. So is everybody there? Don't answer the question quite yet. If you have, don't worry. I'm just going to switch. Um, oh, yeah, so we've got some answers already, but this is the the live tool. So if we've got three people so far, if you answer that question, we have good tools and systems for collecting, managing and analysing data. And you'll see in a minute why I've asked that specific question. Um, so can, some, can you see the number in the bottom right hand corner that's going up as and when? So as I said, you can use this for free for up to two questions, but you can do multiple presentations. So you can be kind of a bit sneaky and use it in a session at different times. Um, there are also a whole range of other question types that you can include. So obviously we've got, gone for the multiple choice bar chart, but um, you can do word cloud. So you can ask people to um, input a word that they're feeling. <coughs> That's quite nice sometimes when you're facilitating a session or consulting a group of people. Um, it's quite a leveler. Some people like to put their hands up and ask questions and contribute. Others, you can kind of be doing that anonymously through your device and you're not having to download um, an app or anything to do that. Uh, you can also ask open-ended questions. We haven't got time to kind of do all of that right now, but okay, so we've got a good sense and I'm gonna have to do some math. So strongly agree and agree we've got 14, a total of 30, so it's just under 50%. So I asked that question because that was a question that was asked um, in a big survey about two years ago and the Data Evolution Project. I don't know if anybody in the room 
knows about that. It was a partnership between Data Kind UK, who are here today running some sessions, and Data Orchard. So they were looking at the data maturity of the sector. So this was one of the things they were interested in um, and, and interested to see whether that held charities back um, kind of access to the, to the right tools. So um, I think for them, it's 40% have good tools and systems collecting, managing and analysing data. So we're a bit, bit above that, but it's something obviously that you're recognising that your charity may not have. Again, um, we'll share these slides. Um, wherever we've got images and charts like this, they're clickable, so you'll be able to go straight to the full report if that's something that you're interested in finding out more. But it was something else they looked at is what charities use data for. Um, so again, we've got some kind of at, at the top legal contract funder reporting. Many of us are collecting data just to report back to funders. Um, recording activity work with clients, measuring outcomes and impact. So they're, they're at the top. Predicting user needs and services are right <coughs> at the bottom. Um, and there'll be an interesting session this afternoon from DataKind looking at the kind of data science and how charities can start to look at their data more to predict um, need and maybe look at focusing resource on where that needs best placed. There's also um, a nice piece looking at where organisations were using their data more, what, what were the actual benefits. So improved products and services, increased knowledge and learning. So um, if you're interested, just click on that link and you'll be able to find out more. Um, the most advanced organisations were also talking about outcomes and impact, saving money, um, increasing credibility and influence. So just kind of framing the session today in terms of why, what, why we're talking about collecting data. So I mentioned before, we've just come out of a five-year project in London supporting small groups to better capture and communicate their impact. And that really took us down the route of supporting <coughs> groups, collect better data and embed better ways of collecting that data. Um, this is a slide for those of you that were um, in for the data viz session earlier. This is also part of the impact management program. So again, you can click and you'll be able to find out um, lots of other useful resources around data. So this is just a way of spitting out when we talk about data, what, you know, what are we actually talking about? This is useful for us to explain to smaller groups. So user data, engagement, feedback, outcomes and impact. Um, and you can click on those and, and get to some further resources. So as for the rest of the morning, our focus is really going to be around data collection linked to um, impact. We're not really going to talk too much about marketing and kind of social media and online analytics, um, but more about how you can build in data capture to start to inform service um, improvement and making sure that you're making you are achieving the change that you're, that you're looking to make. Okay. Do you want to click? Yes. Um, brilliant. So, everybody in the room, hands up if you've got an outcomes framework for some or all of your work. Also, not everybody. So, that's an interesting one. I think it's not always the lens by which we plan um, our work, but um, it is a useful one to look at. So, for anybody that's kind of needing a little bit of a boost, thinking, actually, how do we really track the changes in people's lives who we're working with? An outcomes framework can help you to do that and to look at towards what longer term impact you would you would really like to make and there's lots of really useful resources out there so Katie was here from New Philanthropy Capital um, just before this session if you joined it they've got some great resources on how you can do that on how you can really start to 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 think about the difference you make and then how best you can capture information against that. So we're, we're kind of quite focused on um, technology um, ourselves at Super Highways, but there's some really useful information um, out about kind of thinking about what difference you make. Um, and also, um, for those of you who are um, probably local and in London, um, do check in with your local council for voluntary service as well. Um, they may have some free support or some targeted support around, around creating an outcomes framework. So do have a look for them as well if you need it. Um, so next on... Actually, what um, New Philanthropy Capital also had a look at was... Um, the value, the levels of evidence that you may want to be collecting. So this isn't, that's not that handy. 
Um, so something you might want to think about now, it doesn't mean that anecdotes and quotes are not credible in this line of credibility. It's just looking at kind of what is the most robust data you can be collecting. Um, so at the kind of the more basic end, we do have anecdotes and quotes. So that's fine if that's you're getting some feedback from your service users. Anecdotes and quotes are great. Um, but we could step that up through the, through the levels of credibility. So we've got case studies. Everybody collecting case studies? celebrate their work, a little bit nods, maybe not everybody. Um, some self-reported change, so that could be surveys, it could be kind of in focus groups, it could be other ways that we're collecting information about people saying the difference that's made in their lives. Um, that before and after survey, so that's where we're taking in some benchmarking, that really does show that change between what, what somebody's experience was of the issue or the situation when they first came into your organization and experienced one of your programs and then the after, okay, did it have its intended outcomes? Did it create the change in their lives that you wanted to see? Um, I doubt many of us are in the control groups or randomized controls. Has anybody done a control group or a randomized control? Ooh, that's, that'll be really interesting. So, so what's your name? Where are you? Okay, so that would be really exciting. So if you, if you did want to find out about kind of where you're testing different variables, so you might, for example, give one intervention to um, one group of people and a different intervention to another group of people to assess um, which, is, which is the best type of intervention that we can provide. Not many groups to do that. Usually we don't have the kind of budgets or capacity to do that, and sometimes we wouldn't want to. Some things are very much about um, medical interventions. So testing a drug, for example, does... The the drug work against a placebo. That's not something that we're kind of doing quite often. Um, and a good way of kind of thinking sometimes around how much data should we collect or what, what sort of data can we be collecting is to really, really put yourself in the, in the kind of position of one of your service users or one of the people that experiences your services. So what data are you collecting at different points of in that journey and how integrated is that data so if you think about somebody just from the moment they either ring on a doorbell anybody got a doorbell in their organizations possibly um, or is it online is it the first time somebody sends an email or request what data are you collecting at what points all the way through to them exiting your organization and um, there was a, a, a charity that worked with, I think, Charities Evaluation Services, a London housing group that looked at their beneficiaries' journey through that organisation. So what data would be most relevant at which points they work through. This is something that's quite handy to do with a team. Just sit down, get some post-its out, work out what somebody's journey through your organisation, where are their touch points and who's most appropriate to take that data at that time. Yeah, and I think it's being smart and embedding that so that you're, you're not missing an opportunity as well because you could add in some quick questions. You know, if you're reviewing your forms and looking at what you're not collecting, then kind of mapping it out like this will help. Um, a quick example for us, when we, people book on our training, we use the Eventbrite system that probably lots of people do to administer um, bookings for training. There are some custom questions that you can ask. So we've added a few, you know, not too many, because you've got to kind of gauge um, the time that it takes and also the expectation for somebody booking on. But if we ask for the postcode of their organisation when they book on, we can produce a nice geographical map to see where, um, you know, are we reaching across a specific area? So I think, you know, that helps by kind of mapping, mapping it out. Um, so, yeah, you can do that online or offline. That's entirely up to you. Um, but that's a great one, I think, to just do with post-its and work out. Um, I'm going to leave Kate leading on from here. Um, but I think this is something that sometimes um, still now is a, is a problem for us. Do I actually look like I have time for digital and planning all of this in? So um, we'll, we'll come on to some of the benefits of that and also what you could do. So yeah, these are some nice quotes from the tiny organisations that we support that really their first step is moving from that paper system um, into their, their first steps in terms of online data collection. Um, so just using some really basic tools that can be quite revolutionary um, in terms of getting digital data that can be kind of analysed and shared internally much more easily. Um, and I like the second one. I no longer need to persuade the team leaders of the need for digitising our data collection. It's being automatically driven by GDPR. And I think this time, or this time last year, for some organisations, GDPR was maybe being perceived 
as a barrier sometimes. Um, this was a very small organisation that ran a mental health cafe on a Saturday. It's quite informal. They're vo it's all volunteer led. But I'd, I'd kind of had a one to one digital surgery with um, the coordinator and he was an older man. Um, some of this digital stuff was new to him. I'm not making generalisation that um, that was the case. Um, he got it, what we were talking about, but he, his problem was then kind of taking that back um, with a, a committee of other volunteers and team leaders that kind of had a rotor. Um, at, at the time, they were just using paper, but those piles of paper were being taken back to different volunteers' houses. So there was the issue of not only did, was it collected, I mean, it, it was centralised at some point, but there was always a delay. Um, so it was, it was quite interesting that he came on a GDPR info session that we ran and took it back and actually they realised they could be controlling, kind of authorised, looking at the authorised access much better if it was digitally. And um, it wasn't actually, the using paper was more of a risk. So it was interesting that that became the driver and that's what um, made them take that step. But there are lots of online forms. We haven't got time to go into the detail of why you might choose one over the other. Survey monkey, monkey users in the room. So quite, I mean, that's one that's been around for a long time. I still use that. The purple icon, anybody know? Google Forms. The green one next to it. Sorry? Microsoft. Yes, so that's Office 365 form, which how many people use um, Office 365 in the room? Just keep your hands up if you knew that there was a form app. Yeah, so this is what we find. Um, it's not, it's a bit hidden. People don't know. It has been there for about 18 months and we're going, I'm going to demo it in a minute. Type form, um, so a kind of newer kid on the block. Um, in fact, so if you keep an eye on SurveyMonkey, they're always introducing new features. So if I was running this six months ago, I'd say type form offers this and SurveyMonkey doesn't. <laughs> but actually now taking payment is something that SurveyMonkey could do, which type form um, could before. Sharing dashboards is something that's a new feature in SurveyMonkey, so you can share results externally, directly from um, SurveyMonkey. But um, type form, it's a bit more designer looking, possibly, if you're going to embed a form on your website. Um, but with all of SurveyMonkey type form and Wufu, which I think we've kept there because you can upload images, but again, SurveyMonkey might allow you to do that now. Um, and also take payment. So yeah. if you do need a form that requires some kind of payment, um, some of them don't have those drivers in them. Um, so I guess the, the thing with forms is always thinking about the balance between what you do pay for and what you don't yeah. pay for. Yeah. So for those of you that may not have considered a Google form because you're using SurveyMonkey, actually are you paying for SurveyMonkey when you could be using Google form and especially if you applied for the free non-profit <coughs> Google program um, through Tech Trust and then actually use those forms instead with the same kind of um, functionality yeah. so could you be wasting money on something you don't need to for example it is always working out what are the parameters of what you're collecting and why and where and which which one of those is going to give you the most for the lowest amount of budget as well yeah. especially if you're in a small kind of local organization and I think a lot of this comes down to how much data analysis you're going to do afterwards is it a kind of quick form that you're just getting some basic um, <coughs> data in or with SurveyMonkey, if you upgrade, you can. there is a text analysis option, for example. So if it's a free text box and you've got 100 respondents, you could run text analysis and see keywords that have been <coughs> that have come up. So um, it's having a look at what's, um, what's available in the paid versus the free and then kind of um, making your choice. But I think Google Forms and Office 365 Forms are the place to start if you haven't. Um, and and um, I'll use both of those as well as SurveyMonkey. We're going to do another quick grab your phone. Um, this time it's going to um, bit.ly forward slash office 365 form. You need to have the capital O and the F. I should have made that a bit easier. There's a. So again, you should have a question. And actually, something else just to um, talk about whilst you go there is that the combination of a smartphone and these online forms and being able to add a shortcut to your home screen to, to one of your forms means you could be collecting data wherever you needed to. Um, we'll have a look at, right at the end, we'll look at um, 
some issues around data protection that obviously you need to be thinking of. But um, I've used SurveyMonkey in a community development project where development workers are out in the community all day, every day. They were reporting on paper and kind of giving it to the person in the centralised kind of organisation now and again. But it was there was, a, again, a lag. Now they've all got a shortcut on their phone. They're, they're tapping stuff in. And the other thing just to mention is that with um, microphone... Um, if you switch from your on-screen keyboard to the microphone, people can also be talking in to those free text questions that you might have in the form. That's not to do with the forms, that's to do with your device. So if, whether you've got Android or Apple, you're clicking into a box to use the on-screen keyboard, turn on the microphone, and then um, people can just talk in the answer. So again, we've used that where um, there's been an issue, possibly an issue around literacy, and um, somebody can just talk in, they're not having to worry whether they're um, spelling things right or not. Okay, so if you, did everybody get somewhere with that link? So, do you want to answer the question? I'm not sure, I think this is where the Wi-Fi... Okay, so I ha I'm not going to pull it up on the screen, but you can see it's just like Google Forms, really. You've got um, a pie chart, it's probably changing a bit now. Um, but you've got a tab where you enter your questions, and then a tab where you've got results and you can share that link as well. So um, just, a, you know, another tool. And especially if you're using Office 365, why not start using the forms that are there? You can share them when you set up a form. You can either set them up if you're using Teams or something. You can set the form up within a team and then everybody in that team will see the results. Otherwise, you have to share the link. Uh, oops. Mm. So not time to kind of do full demos, but... Um, really just some, some things for you to go back and, and have a, a play with. Um, we've got this slide because sometimes the, if you click on the big image there, it's quick tap survey. So we were set a challenge by a young carers organisation that take young carers out on trips. They're coming back on the minibus. They used to hand out paper forms for people to fill in. They weren't going to be guaranteed with an internet connection. Quick tap survey, it works offline, it will sync when you're back on Wi-Fi. So um, there was a small cost per month to use that. It was something like, it's probably changed a bit now with the um, exchange rates, but it's about £10 a month. So it's something that could be written into a funding bid and it meant that they could use that time when everybody's inside the minibus. They can pass around a tablet and they can get the feedback that they need. The other, sm um, the other links are to... Um, SMS surveys, and I think Sora's going to talk a bit more about that. So again, when you get the slides, you can click on any of those logos. It will take you to those websites. So only just a bit, is anybody using SMS tools to kind of capture data at all? No, nobody in the room. So it's an interesting one. Kate and I were um, over in the US. We went to a technology <coughs> conference there. It's really common in the U US, but they have a very different setup with the um, phone providers in terms of how some of those products have been created and um, delivered. Um, there is a way of doing that bulk. So what you're really talking about is bulk text messaging um, that's through a service and you can manage it through an online portal so you're not actually doing it with your phone um, and, and being able to communicate with a wide range of people um, what we heard from people in the states and certainly anybody that's done it here in the UK and is using SMS it, it increases your engagement rate dramatically um, in comparison to other forms of digital capture um, it's because it's in people's hands it's in their pockets and it's part of their everyday usage so um, we might all feel we're a little bit annoyed by us being asked you know um, when we've bought a product you've just bought a kettle and they want you to review it and how great is this kettle and you think it's just a kettle like I just I don't, I don't really want to do that um, and that puts us off thinking of SMS as a, as a valuable option but actually when you think about people have received very valuable services from you um, that it means a lot to them and it's the same with any data capture explaining your purpose why you're capturing that information and how valuable that is and how important it is is the same no matter what capture methodology you use so um, sms has a real um, opportunity to to kind of expand it's also great um, for people you might anybody using kind of whatsapp or any of the other messaging services to capture data from people no. So I think, yeah, a little bit. There's, so I think thinking about how, depending on your audience, you know, are they people that are kind of on the internet all the time and desktop, or are they on their mobile phones? Um, and that's, that's where you're, you're kind of getting. Maybe people don't even still 
um, have smartphones, for example, in the communities that you're trying to reach, but people have a text, and that might be a way of staying in mm. touch with people, but also asking them very valuable questions about how well you're performing or um, information that's very specific to your outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Um, so um, I wouldn't write off text. We've also been working so um, through the Law Centers Network. Um, they've worked with an American company called Twilio, which is an SMS <coughs> platform, um, to produce a UK-wide platform that will be released shortly. That's at the moment um, in just in terms of appointments and letting people know, um, you know when the next thing's coming up. So it's staying in touch with people, yeah. but <coughs> it could be expanded and, and should be, we would say, expanded think, to include. I think that's their intention. And they're starting off at, so this will be made available for all the law cent the local law centers i think um and and we're gonna we need to do a case study of that so we can point people to find yeah. out further information but it's an interesting process design process that they went through to get that to get there because i think they had a very different idea at the beginning um I'll so we just wanted to kind of highlight as well, thinking about this is a little bit less about your actual technology you're using to capture your information, although sometimes the way you ask questions can change depending on um, the technology you're using. Obviously, a question you might put out um, in one format might not be... Um, the same as you put out in another. Um, so often mobile surveys, for example, if you were to use smart survey or quick tap survey, um, the question formation may be slightly different um, depending just so that it makes sense for the for the tool, like for a slider scale or a, for example that you're using, um, might look very different to something you're doing on paper. Um, there are some links here to asking better questions. So those questions which are less biased, less leading, um, that can get genuine answers. If you're, if you're interested in shaping the quality of your services, then you do need to make sure that, that you're doing that and it's not just capturing information that shows how good we are, which in a tight funding environment, I think we're, we can be in danger of doing, is to ask those questions which give us is, is, is this kind of working? Yes, that's great, brilliant. Now we can go get some, we can go get some cash, but actually, are you asking questions that mean that you will change the direction of how you're delivering something? Um, and that's really important. So there's some links there to asking better questions because it's, it's quite important. Um, did you say a picture is worth a thousand words? They are part of your data capture. So it is worth thinking about them in the mix when you are um, capturing images of people. Every single snapshot you take and share um, is data capture. It's personal. And it's, it's giving an example of how well or not well or um, providing kind of image of your, your service and your service delivery. So um, any Instagram users in the room and, yeah, a little bit. Um, Flickr, anybody fl using Flickr? A couple of hands. The, I think what's useful about Flickr is if you do need to capture, especially when it's about your service delivery, um, and you may want those to be in a private album, but you're, you're, you've got multiple people, perhaps volunteers, who are all saving into one place, this can be a useful um, storage space for capturing <coughs> images in one place via your mobile devices um, and put in private albums so that they can't be downloaded by others. So just maybe a useful heads up on images. Any others? Does anybody, anybody have anything anywhere else that they're storing the photos that they take or using it as part of participatory work in a little bit? Yeah. There's a service called Click Tools, which has decent image storage. Yeah. So again, that's a pay for. Sure. Do we know what kind of pricing structure uh, they have? Or? About ten dollars a month. Okay. Okay. We can have that. okay so yeah. Yeah. That's. I think the same. The same thing with any data capture. Anything you use is always about storage. So yeah. where is stuff going? How many people are collecting data? Where is all that going? So I don't know if anybody's. And I've done this myself. Is that where do we need to find that information? I don't know. It's buried down in somebody else's project files. Right, so if you're taking data from people, that stuff has to be in a, it stored in a way that is meaningful. And if you leave the organisation, if anything kind of else changes, that you can map that against that person. So it's really important. Okay. Um, so um, anybody collecting audio? Anybody done any audio collection? Are you recording any interviews with your beneficiaries a little bit? Yeah. So for those of you that have, what have you found has been the value or the benefit of doing that? Yep. Um, for us, <coughs> it's, it's anonymous and also yep. 
somebody else into the room where yeah. they might not otherwise feel comfortable doing it. Yeah, and I think for, we found the same thing. It's When you say an anonymous, I'm presuming you're comparing it to, to a video where you'd have somebody on screen. Um, instead, you could think about audio recording somebody, and we found that that's, A, much easier to do yourselves because you're just holding a tablet next to somebody and they're talking rather than having to do the, the videoing at the same time. But also we found people like to talk and they feel less intimidated if they're not on camera at the same time. Um, anything else? Kate mentioned it earlier. I don't know if you found this yourselves as well. So there is the thing around literacy and enabling people to be as full and as, as expressive mm. as they might be in speech is very different to when you ask somebody to fill in a form. So as soon as somebody fills in a form, it's already you've taken them a step back in terms of the way their brain works. We all do it. Suddenly we're having to try and be the best copywriters in the world. And, um, and we go, oh, don't, oh, that was great, thanks, and we're out. So speech is the thing that gets people to open up. So even if you don't publish, recording interviews can be a really good way of getting very rich data. So, which so we're, to, we're to um, yeah, I'll just explain a couple. So we've been using um, as our recording space and um, sharing space for audio, um, audio boom, um, which until <laughs> this is where we cry as people that work in technology. Um, they used to have an app that you could use on um, Android and on Apple devices, um, which would mean that you could record on the app um, and make some simple edits and then upload to the online shared um, space, yeah. um, the portal which you would have create your free account in and then they changed it to being paid um, and now they've taken away the app so that's very sad but you can still um, you can still pay for it as a great spoken word sharing space um, if you need to publish your recordings um, which <coughs> can be embedded on your site just like YouTube videos So, um, and it's a place that's for podcasting so there are lots obviously the BBC and various other people that might use this for um, actually doing podcasting that people can download and listen to um, SoundCloud, obviously SoundCloud is for music primarily rather than speech. Um, that's what it was set up to do, was for aspiring artists and musicians to share that information. Um, the great thing about SoundCloud is for a free account, you can have three hours of free publishing time. Um, and you can have, again, private recordings. So if you need somewhere out and about to be collecting recordings, you could be doing that into, in, and each post would be private until you decide whether you need to publish it or not or download it to another system. Mm -hmm. So it's just an option for both being able to capture data but then make a decision about whether you're going to publish that online afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's that bit around, are we, are we capturing something just to shape the quality of our service or to show to a funder, for example, um, the difference our work makes or are we publishing more broadly with a wider audience so has anybody just listening to that has anybody got an idea where they think actually this could work really well for us and wouldn't mind being a quick guinea pig we haven't got time we've got some other tablets there's too many people in the room and I don't think we've got time for you to to do this we run a day session on um the power of audio storytelling and we do a little bit around interview techniques and and people go away being really comfortable to use these um, apps. But it'd be nice to do a quick demo. Um, any volunteers? Paul, I was going to say, if there were no volunteers, I might have asked Paulie. <laughs> so I've got Paulie, the SoundCloud app. Paulie, might ask app. you to come to front so that you're on yeah. the screen. You'll yeah. Be TV star. <laughs> so I've just um, opened the SoundCloud app on this big tablet. It's connected to our account. So as we're doing this, Sora will switch online and we'll, we should hopefully see uh, what we found as well is th um, sometimes we'll do very short sound bites other times we'll do much longer interviews and it's really thinking about what you want to do with the audio afterwards but quite often we've ended up um, compiling lots of different audio and um, putting together a digital story so mixing pictures with the audio and it might be audio from a number of different people or, or from one person and um, so you get a visual you're hearing some people also are happy to have their photo taken as part of that. Okay, so I'm going to do... Okay, record. Right, so I've just switched on record. Um, and I'm just going to ask Pauline to tell us a little bit about where, what she thinks this might be useful for. Um, I'm doing, I've, I've done a project in the past, uh, oral history project, so it's handy to get people's stories um, straight away and they tend to remember other things as they go along where they might not remember if they're writing stuff down. Yeah. 
Um, I interviewed somebody at a uh, the president of Ireland visited Birmingham on okay. Monday, and I interviewed an older person who had a memory of establishing a Tuesday club, a club for elders, and she was very animated. Um, I was filming her as well, but her voice was really animated about yeah. it, and she was delighted to be interviewed. So okay. that was really good. Great. So I've got orange sound waves now there, and I can just um, go through the instructions to now post recording. I skipped taking a picture. I could have asked Pauline, can I take a picture of you? Um, I didn't even name it, so hopefully we'll just see a new one come up. So this is what it would look like in your account. Um, Audio Boom, we always preferred in terms of the kind of public facing. You set up an account, link the app to your account, and then it syncs automatically. So um, that's it, I think. Sounds from Wednesday morning. We haven't got the sound on actually, but just to show you, no, but just to show you that it, it's it's a kind of live thing, and for us, it doesn't mean that you're having to plug your phone. You know, there's, you'll, you'll have a voice recorder on your phone as well. Before you might have had to come back, plugged your phone in, uploaded the audio file. This just makes it much nice and sim simple. You can also organise your audio sound bites into projects. So we've done that before and shared back with the funder, for example, kind of grouped things so that. Um, you, can, you can tell a story of a number of different people that have accessed something in particular. And as Sorrel said, you can, by default, you can, it will um, publish publicly. So somebody could search through SoundCloud and find our account and find this. But equally, um, the great thing about SoundCloud is you can also opt for private publication, which means it will only be accessed by you as you log in. So you can go in and add the image afterwards. Quite often when I'm doing this, I just want to publish it because I don't want to lose that, you know, great audio interview but you can go in and um, and make lots of changes once it's there and put a description in and I think that's something that we've picked up a lot put in quite a rich description because some people might be accessing this when they have when they haven't got headphones or um, to listen but as they could still get a sense of sometimes we've we haven't found the tool that will automatically transcribe for us but that would be that would be great well maybe we can share that afterwards yeah thank you very much for thank you <laughs> Let's go back. Is that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, that's what we didn't have time for. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few examples of where people, what people have then done next. So they're very little examples, but um, once you've started to capture your data, it's thinking about what you can do with it. This is an example of a, this is a, another Young Carers project. Um, somebody came on it. Excel training that we ran. So it was quite, quite basic. We did kind of go up to pivot tables and they started to really explore their data more. And what I like about this example, you won't be able to see the chart um, that clearly, but basically they had cuts to their funding. They weren't able to run as many youth clubs. They had to kind of centralize where that offer was. They looked at their database to see the spread of young carers <coughs> in the borough across the postcode. So that's what the bar chart is. Um, and the blue is the information from the database. So far left hand side, KT4, they knew there were young carers that lived there, but there was nobody from that area accessing the, the youth club. So um, they kind of delved in and although they had that hunch, now they actually had the data to prove it. And they went to a funder, got a small pot of funding to pay for a minibus to go out to those areas and pick people up and take them to the to the youth club. So it's just a, you know a little tiny ex example. Now you can see in green that there was access from um, other areas and there was a a rise actually anyway with the number of young carers registered. Um, but just a kind of simple thing. Once you started collecting the data, they had the postcode data, so they could then delve in a little bit more. We kind of talked about data capture, and yes, you can use spreadsheets, but there might be a point where you're actually needing to think of a system. Um, some of these systems will allow data capture straight into them. Others, you might have to capture your data and put them in. Um, anybody in the room using any of these? So there, there are kind of free and low, not free, lower cost systems, I would say. So again, when you get these slides, you can click on the logos to find out more. Um, but we found with the slightly larger organizations around about 500,000, they're maybe looking um, 
or starting to think that they need a system, especially if they're running multiple projects where individuals, same individuals are accessing more than one service. So um, just some information for anyone that's kind of at that stage, you can have a look at those systems. Um, we would recommend that whatever budget you have, don't spend it all on the system. All of those are online systems, so there'll be a cost per month. Sometimes that's a cost per month per user. Other times it's a cost per month per functionality that you're using. Think about saving some of your budget for training, embedding. Um, otherwise, you'll end up with a system that could do what you want, but it's not doing what you want. You're not getting the data in because it's not embedded within the organization. People don't understand the importance of it. They haven't been brought along on the journey. So we always talk about 40, 60. I, I need to remember where I got that from, but it's thinking about the, the spend on the system, the 40, and actually more of a spend on making sure that it's embedded, having a budget to, rev to review regularly, um, having a budget that when new people come in, they can be trained up. And then this is um, just some quick snapshots from an organization that moved to one of those systems and what it actually meant. They kind of reflected a year later. Um, so implementation of a new case and information management system has streamlined how we record our work on a daily basis across all of our activities. Um, they're very much more using that data to inform how they're delivering services um, and also to secure funding. Some of this comes full circle to that data maturity um, survey. But also, interestingly, they, they felt that it put them in a much better position when there was an opportunity to scale up and run a service in neighboring boroughs. So having that kind of, having gone through that process of a um, bit more methodological kind of data capture and storage, meant that that helped them um, when they got to that point of scaling up. Um, and they're now in a position where they're looking at working with um, other organisations that do the same as them across London. And there's also talk of some collaboration and kind of sharing and looking at analysing the data and can that data be pulled up so there's a London picture. Um, OK. So we've got five minutes and... Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on data visualisation. I know some of you were in the room for Katie's talk. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not going to um, spend time reading these out. We're going to send um, these through to you. These are really at the kind of the next step in data visualisation. So if you if you have a kind of more complex data, um, if you've got some kind of um, uh, technology skills within your teams, then these are the places that you might be able to go um, to really turn that data into something like dashboards, um, really incredible maps um, that could really be used to kind of share with policymakers, change makers, um, all your different audiences. Um, some really exciting stuff in there. And there's also some support for charities within um, most of those as well. Um, they are at the upper end. You do have to have some knowledge of using data and using these systems to be able to do it. I don't think they're off the bat if you've never used anything before. Um, I don't think these are the places to start. However, if you want to go back a step and do um, a little bit more, um, just even these are just examples of things that have been done very simply and very by very tiny micro organizations um, at a borough level um, and these are using kind of tools which are quite simple either within your own database so often your own database will have um, reports that you can just churn out quite quickly and have some data visualizations for example how um, people have moved through your organization it might be that you've tracked those outcomes in a I don't want to call it a star. The star is actually um, that is the outcome trademarked, star. No, but that, that is, is the yeah. outcome star, so I'm okay. Um, you'll find um, outcome stars are also called wheels and um, other names Web. because that's mm -hmm. been <laughs> trademarked. Um, but that's, yeah, your database may give you some really useful data visualizations that you can share very simply and, and also understand within your teams how well either both individuals are moving, but also how groups, um, groups of people are moving through your service. Um, Picture chart, anybody using picture chart in the rooms, a few picture chart users, even Canva. Um, Canva, these are things you can use for free, 
um, and get charity discounts or charity upgrades for for free mm -hmm. um, to use their business versions. So they're, they're really good little tools to play around with and get started with your data visualizations. Um, and then we've got um, some mapping tools as well. Um, Batch Geo is one of the simplest ones you can use. Get your Excel data, postcode data, drop it into, you go online, go to Batch Geo, literally paste your data into the slot that says paste data here, <coughs> and it will create a really easy map for you. There are some limitations in the amount of data that you can actually paste in, but if you're looking for a really quick kind of visualization, it's free. You can, you can make sure it doesn't go down to street level, so if you need to protect people's identities, that's really important. Mm. Um, you can do that. Um, those and, are some quick things to do. And this little example, you probably just about make out the blue and the red markers. So this was an organisation that had existing volunteers are in blue. Again, they expanded and they had referrals of clients in red from a new area. And they were struggling because the idea was matching a, a local volunteer with a, a local family. Um, so they, they were struggling with that. Once they, you know, once I said, if you've got the postcodes, we can just shove that on the map. You can look at how that looks like and then use that information to target where you need to recruit more volunteers. So, um, yeah, they're quite basic things. But what it, you know, what that insight then gives you in terms of for this um, example, a kind of operational um, help you rather than just randomly advertise for volunteers. You won't be able to see the names, but you know, there are particular town names there that they could then go out into um, to recruit. So we've come to the end. I'm not sure whether people have to choose between lunch or answering some questions, but um, these are, um, we've put together a sheet, a double kind of A4 sided sheet, which you can download. You can click on this um, slide and it will go straight there. So our favorite apps 2018. So some of what we've covered, we've raced through some of that data viz at the end, but there'll be some, um, we'll have listed all of those apps if you didn't get a chance to jot those down. I, I mentioned that we talk about best practice. I think when we, whenever we're talking about data collection, you need to be um, on top of really that kind of responsible use of data. So there are just some links Again, if I'd run this session two years ago, probably it wouldn't be quite as on top of everybody's minds, but I think you'll all have gone through a GDPR kind of review process. Um, and then making sure that your data is secure. So again, there are some links. Um, that infographic link at the bottom is to the cybersecurity um, infographic. They're, they're here today as well. Just quickly for anybody in London, um, you can click on this slide and you'll see what we've also been funded by the DCMS to do some digital leadership work. So if you're a London organization and you want some help um, thinking about digital leadership, we're targeting trustees and CEOs, but we can actually come out to trustee boards and help trustee boards kind of think about digital in a different way and in relation <coughs> to your organization mission. So click on that. Um, image and you'll go to the, our web page where we've got all the information about that. That's only running to the end of March, so it's something to snap up quickly. And then we've got our contact details. And so that's, yeah, yeah. I know we've raced through things a little bit today. If you do have any questions, just drop them to us. And, um, and from next week, we'll yeah. be a little bit more calm as we um, go into our <coughs> digital leadership. We've just been putting in a funding bid. So we've been, as you will all know, up to our eyeballs up until today. So um, hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions if you have any that we can't do now. Yeah. All right, we'll okay, do, yeah, do follow Thank up you. if Thank something... Thank you for your time and for coming to our session. Yeah.